welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited to have Nick Fitz with us today, founder and CEO of Momentum. Hey, Nick, welcome to the nonprofit show. Hey, Julia, how you doing? Great. I'm so super jealous of you because we were talking in the green room. You're coming to us from San Francisco where it's a balmy 60 degrees. <laughs> oh man, how dare you? Come on when it's so hot in the rest of the parts of the I'm country. sorry. I'm sorry. It's nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, as I said, I grew up in D.C. and um, have lived in a lot of parts of the country, most of which are not this nice. So I feel so <laughs> obligated to be out here. Yeah, you need to be outside. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're going to be talking with Nick about leadership gifts and how we can lean into them, especially for those of us in the nonprofit sector looking at fall events and fall calls to action where we might be using leadership gifts. What do they look like? How do they behave? How do we behave around them? I guess more importantly. So we're really excited to have this conversation um, with Nick. We're also really excited to support and, and promote our sponsors who promote and support us. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new uh, Friday show, which is really fun. Um, and then 180 Management Group. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. We've got these amazing co-hosts, and I'm sure you've come to really enjoy them as I have. Okay, Nick Fitz, founder and CEO of Momentum. Tell us first off what Momentum does. Sure. So, um we build a platform to manage relationships with your donors. Um, one maybe specific way to think about it is that it's like an inbox like Gmail uh, or your Outlook that makes a plan for you, connects to your CRM, uh, helps you figure out what to do today and what to say and when, and then helps you do a bunch of the administration around running a funnel. So getting contact reports in and uh, having a bunch of stuff synced to the CRM, but um, essentially helping you spend more time talking to donors and, and less time on a bunch of the sort of administrative stuff around it. Amazing. So it's really kind of aiding in the task management. Um, That's right. Or, it's like task management and email and communications. It sits on a CRM and it helps you kind of uh, make a plan and execute on that plan essentially and then follow up. Is this strictly for um, development staff or is anybody in a C-suite could use it? How do you how does that yeah work? it's um it's for anyone at the org database administrators as well um mm -hmm. it's different of course depending on what you do but it's meant mm -hmm. to support a whole org in the kind of work they're doing um, and so the the kinds of jobs to be done or the things people are doing with them are different right some major gift officers are um, focused on maybe making calls or doing a bunch of meetings and they're focused on contact reports right board mm -hmm. members or, or cdos or eds are more focused on like getting out a batch of emails for an update or, or you know, interacting with the board or something. But mm -hmm. the sort of work we're all doing where we're reaching out to people, trying to follow up, keep track of it is all essentially the same. Wow. Interesting. Super cool. Well, um, I'm thrilled you're here today on the nonprofit show. And I think this this conversation we're going to have is really powerful. And, you know, we always hear about leadership gifts. And I mean, you hear the word gift and leadership together. What could right. be better? What could go <laughs> wrong? But talk to us and define, help us define what a leadership gift even is. So we, we kind yeah. of start. Yeah. And it's one of those things that tends to be a bit different depending on the org. But essentially, leadership gifts are those that sit, you know, above the annual fund and under the under major gifts, just very broadly. Mm -hmm. um, Say for a mid-size org, they tend to be between a thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars. For a, say a, a much a large R1 university, it might be between ten thousand and a hundred thousand. Right? If, if the major gifts threshold is a hundred thousand and up, uh, leadership will look something like ten to a hundred thousand. Um, and what's interesting about it is parts of leadership giving look similar to the annual fund, and parts look like major giving. You know, it might. Often the way that it's distributed is maybe five to 10% of the donors are, are in this leadership category, um, but maybe 20 to 30% of the money comes from them. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, it's, it's an efficient group of people and there's um, some particular ways to think about how to interact with them. So when you think about leadership gift, is it, is it also um, an opportunity to take, dare I say, prominent members of a community to say, 
I'm supporting this. It's more of a public situation or how do you see that nuance? Um, I think it's similar to major gifts that way where, right. One important thing about leadership gifts is it, it to the donor, <laughs> it depends on the capacity of the donor, right? So to a $10,000 gift or $50,000 gift might be, um, it often is very significant to that donor. And so it feels sort of like a major gift. It tends yeah. not to be so public, that sort of thing. There, there are other people in this uh, category, maybe that give that 50,000, but have the capacity to give 500, 500,000 or a million. And in that case, maybe it's uh, something that they might give publicly or, or feel sort of um, less powerful. Uh, right. In those ways, right? It's, it's those two things in some ways describe different ways to treat people in that you may have, uh, you're like, person running leadership gifts may have a, a, a portfolio of a thousand donors um, as mm -hmm. opposed to this is called a hundred for a major gift officer relative. And it, this makes mm -hmm. sense in that the average gift, major gift is about 10 times more than the, than the average leadership gift. And so in, in, in this case, people are doing a bunch of the things you might do with major gift donors, like meeting them in person or, um, or just really personal kind of cultivation. Uh, and then there are some people who maybe are giving at their max and, and they're just really, core parts of the community they bring other people in and so you know uh, they're engaged with in a different way than say people who might um give that 50k but can give much more and so that's what's worth you know leadership tends to have a bunch of um it's worth doing a bunch of analysis basically on this the fact that their last gift was 50k doesn't necessarily predict that they're going to be a major major donor right people tend to take right. just the the last gift or the highest gift and say okay well this is our portfolio and in fact like it's worth looking at, you know, does the person run a company that that, that may exit? Are they going to get an inheritance, right? Are they are there other signals that might predict whether they could be a major donor? Um, mm -hmm. They aren't so much about the last gift, so right, they could be overlooked or missed something. They're missed in this way, right? Nick, before we move on, um, let me ask you this: Do you see leader get leadership gifts as an integral part of? like kicking off a season or a capital campaign or maybe even an event? I mean, tying it to more of a specific action within a nonprofit or do you just see this as across the board? Yeah, I see it as across the board in the same way you mm -hmm. want a healthy um, distribution of donors across these different things. Leadership gifts like major gifts tend to be, um, tend to take say more impressions to generate be more personal, and so I do think um, I do think there's a lot of value in in, in tying them to particular events. But it's te it's it's it really depends on the sort of person, right? Like people may be used to making their leadership gift at the end of the year. Um, they may be more open to um, to sort of gathering others and having an event, but but they may not be. And so I, I think it's um, there may be more nuanced or, or less clear sort of how to approach the cultivation of leadership gifts mm -hmm. than say the annual fund where you're sending out hundreds of thousands of emails, mm -hmm. right? A direct mail or something like this, or the or major gifts where you're inviting people to events. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's get on to our next question that we have for you, because I think this is going to be a really interesting kind of part of this discussion. And when we think about the different, you know, levels of our donors. And, and again, you said it brilliantly. It's different for every organization and it's even different for every donor. I mean, what, you know, the, the amounts are so personal because depending on what your own resources are and, and how you've come to them and earned them, it's, it's very, very different. Okay. But what do you recommend in terms of strategies that will help us secure leadership gifts? Because this is a very different animal. Yeah, it is. So, um, I think one of the first things to do is in the same way, maybe that we, we were very particular about who gets into major gift portfolios. And I think it's worth um, spending almost as much time um, prospect, you know, identifying and prospecting who can be, who can uh, be a, a leadership annual giver. Right. And so partially that's because the portfolio sizes are so big that it's easy to be inefficient, right? Or spend time on the, on, on sort of uh, maybe the wrong donors. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I'd say maybe is it's not so different in some of the ways you think about cultivating major donors that it, it might be 11 touches or eight touches. There may be things like um, the sort of obvious things apply where like meetings in person are better than phone calls are better than sort of asynchronous communication like emails. Um, but there is, I think a really unique thing about leadership gifts in that 
there's a bit more of a community. Like you have annual giving and uh, people may give some money, but not feel part of something. And major donors tend to be much more individualistic or care in particular, like care a lot about their particular impact. Mm -hmm. uh, they're more the heroes of their own story, but leadership gifts, you have this sort of ability to um, bring people together in a collective way and say, let's, let's participate in this event or, hey, there's a hundred of us, we're trying to get to 500 of us, right? Or can you bring in some friends or we're trying to hit this goal. Uh, and then that way you can pull out people who are sort of hubs who can bring other people in or, or pull out people who are sort of consistent. Like there's, um, I think it's worth doing basically a, a bunch of analysis that you might not do at the beginning of it. Yeah. And then the sort of cultivation and stewardship strategies aren't so different than major gifts, but there's things you can do at scale, right? That are like just saying, hey, I want to double, I want to check in with somebody and send an email check. You know, th there's a variety of things you might be able to do that are easier to do for this group of people than you would have to, than you might feel comfortable doing for major gifts, basically. Do you see this um, kind of being managed or thought of almost as like um, the old fashioned giving society where um, everybody knows that it's a certain amount and that they get uh, maybe s special access. I f I'm thinking of um, the university system across the United States right. where you have certain giving society levels. And when you are a part of that, then you might be invited to, you know, high profile speakers or dinners or thought leadership, right. you know, opportunities. Does that ever factor in or does that look like this? You often see that sort of thing here um, and, yeah. and you have. It's not so different than the sort of things that are offered to major donors. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, maybe the like perks are, are different or the sort of talks they're invited to. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think like anything, if you invite a thousand people to something, maybe a few hundred will come. And so mm -hmm. you are able you are able to do a lot of this similarly personalized or sort of intimate activities you might do to cultivate major donors mm -hmm. with leadership donors. Um, or leadership givers. The other sort of thing that you know you're able to do, as we said, is like um, things that might feel you don't need to have a dinner of six people. You can have a event of fifty, but you're like we're all part of this sort of club, or we're all giving gotcha. this amount, right? And you see that yeah. sort of legacy feeling, or you see that right. um, thing of like let, let's go play golf or something like this. Um, right. And that tend to that tends to be quite valuable. You know, the value of there's obviously the money that that you know you look at the annual budget every year and think how much came for leadership from the leadership annual fund and mm -hmm. um, you know what does that look like relative to the others but i think unlike like maybe the the most particular way or one of the really um, unique things about leadership giving is that they can be this place to upsell or to find major gift prospects from um, and, and again I, it's the best way to do that is not on their last gift, of course, but th mm -hmm. this, this, it tends to highlight people that may be interested in doing more or may have the capacity. Um, mm -hmm. And so ranking them or, or sorting them by sort of ask to capacity ratio or, um, you know, doing more analysis on them and spending more time individually, you know, having the prospect team spend some more time on them is um, tends to have a pretty high ROI relative to other other um, segments. Right, right. Well, and I think it's a, it, it seems to me like it's a good strategy in general to understand and drill down more about who you who your donors are who they can be and what the stratification is right versus just kind of throwing it all out there and, and hoping something happens um let's talk about something that it seems like this is leaning into all of my car i should not say leaning in but bleeding into all of our conversations here on the nonprofit show and that's what is the role of ai and what are you seeing um about this and, and what should we expect? What should we embrace? Um, it seems to me, Nick, and I'd love to get your feedback on this. We have, we have people that just love this and have really embraced it or others that seem abjectly afraid of it right. and refuse to even enter it into the conversation or allow it into their, their operation. So right. what's going on here? Yeah, I think um, it's like a complicated, scary thing for people and it's new and there's yeah. um, it's a big word and it, and it, it sort of matters how you use it and, and what we're talking about. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I will say um, one of our advisors, Nathan Chappelle, um, has a great way of thinking about this, where he's like, you know, AI isn't going to replace fundraisers. Right. People give to people. It's, a, it's incredibly intimate, like trust based human thing. Um, but it, it, it may people that use AI, you know, will have a huge advantage, essentially fundraisers who do it. Um, 
And I think when it comes to the whole, um, when it comes to basically raising money in general, and then in particular around sort of the, the around leadership giving, you tend to see it used, let's say, in three ways. And I'll say I think it's it's very helpful when it is saving people time on administrative tasks or um, helping make the relationship more intimate. Um, it's there are ways, of course, where it, this sort of flips. Um, but the three the three places you see it come up often are sort of on. Um, this question of who to reach out to and when. So this is what people call like predictive AI um, mm -hmm. in learning. And basically it's saying like, you know, reach out to, it's how it's what we use to make donor plans for people or to build on their donor plans, right? To say, reach out to this person. Um, here's how they'd like to be contacted. Here's a model of how much, we, you know, we think they can give that sort of predicting numbers from stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been around for some time. It's, it's like, <laughs> in some ways, it's just like an advanced version of statistics. Um, there is, uh, or at least you could get some of the, a lot of the same value out of this. Um, the stuff that is people are super excited about recently, right, and that has um, sort of taken the world by storm is what is called generative AI, right, and that's um, things that are being generated, right. So we use this for you know, drafting emails for people, letters, call scripts, this sort of thing, um, and people just to be clear, are totally fine with snippets and stuff. Like this is a thing that can help you, but you don't need to use it, right? It's it, you, people right. Are fine without it, um, right? And it's, I think, particular, it's useful to say, okay, well, why don't we use one part of the email to say, okay, like, you know, write something that's based off of what's happened with them currently, right? So it will pull LinkedIn or Twitter or things and draft mm -hmm. something for you around the weather. But um, it, it's it's a nuanced thing. You don't want you, you don't want to write the whole email uh, necessarily, yeah. right? It's, this is, I think, where people get um, where it's a complicated relationship maybe with it and it doesn't necessarily need to be, you can just say, don't, don't use it, keep emailing. Um, and then the third part <laughs> that is um, maybe one of the biggest advances because it's, it's so hard to do before it is around kind of sort of what's called natural language processing or automatic speech recognition. But this is where you see tools where we'd have this conversation and it would record it and then give us the transcript and the summary. And so we do some of that stuff like after a, uh, a meeting a donor, a meeting a fundraiser has, we'll text them and say, you know, what happened and they can leave a voice note and, and talk about, you know, what happened in that meeting. We'll ask them what are your next steps and when do you want to take that next step? And they can sort of interact by voice. It'll save it and write it all up to their to their CRM. And so in, in places like that, it's very valuable to take voice recordings and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and there's many other applications of this, but you tend to see the, these main things. And so, um, it's helping people essentially think about who to reach out to when, what to say. Mm -hmm. I, I think with the, when it comes in particular to leadership giving, it's, it's like maybe the right way to think about it is in thinking about the specific plans, right? If you're trying to manage a thousand people versus a hundred, who right. you reach out to that day becomes very important. Sending batch emails to like these 15, but that are personalized becomes important, right? Like, right. um, pulling people out and, and triaging folks up and down, you know, between portfolios or between segments matters. And so the, that like sort of constant um, analysis and review is, is maybe more important than some of the stuff on major gifts. Right. Right. Well, it seems to me like it's, uh, you, you said this earlier, and I think this is really an interesting thing, which I hadn't thought of it this way um, in that this leadership segment is somewhat fluid and you have the opportunity to move them around right, right. you have the opportunity to um, get them to be even more of a leader within your organization if you will right. engage them even more or in a specific way from naming rights to endowment it seems to me like um, this is a level where you can navigate more opportunity for everyone and drill down on what that donor is looking for right i mean maybe they have a passion or a funding objective that hasn't really been discovered, but with this relationship, it allows you to navigate towards that. Is that a fair comment? I think that's exactly right. And, and sort of back to what we were talking about before, they don't expect the same level of one-to-one -one relationship that you might from a major donor, right? Somebody gives $500,000, a million dollars, they expect a certain level of, um, call it service in some way. Yeah. Um, someone true. gives you know, 10,000, 50,000 back to this point of, feeling sort of collectivist, they can, you can say like, let's look at affinity. So we have a bunch of alumni, let's say, who are giving 20,000, who all loved basketball, like let's bring them together for a game, right? And we gotcha. can bring 50 of them together, right? And so that scale um, is very important. Like you can, you can say, okay, they love, 
basically tie, you know, connecting people around affinity or around likes or, or where they went or what they're doing or activities or people that they, that they share in common um, mm -hmm. is much more possible. And then you get these network effects with leadership annual that it's, that are much harder to get in the six person dinner. Right. Very interesting. You know, I love this. Um, I love this approach because it's a little different than maybe what we're all used to. And I think it's a, it, it's a really, um, it's a smart thing to be talking about. I think this kind of moves me to my next question and we don't have a lot of time left with you, but the psychology of giving, because it seems to me that a lot of what we've been talking about kind of dovetails back into the psychology of the process, right. how our donors feel about us, how we in the nonprofit sector feel about our donors, which right. we need to talk about that as well. So yeah. what are you seeing here and what are your thoughts around the psychology of giving? <laughs> Yeah, I'm also curious how it shifted. So I, I, for years, I was in academia doing research on the psychology of small dollar donors, of major donors, and then of the of fundraisers raising money from these folks. Um, and you tend to see some pretty broad patterns. People give because they want to feel good, right? They want to give. They want to give. They want to. You know, they want to look good. They want to, of course, have an impact. Um, yeah. And there are all these different things that block them, right? That they are. There's like choice overload or paralysis. Like you know, there's yeah. so many orgs asking for money. Um, there's just general friction, like it's hard to do so, right? It's, um, if you want to give to your DAF, right? There's new tools to do this, but generally things have been maybe hard to do. Um, and then there's kind of a question of appealing to, um, you know, people's sort of deeper values and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think the, well, we could talk for an hour about this. Like the, <laughs> the psychology of giving is a, is a huge topic and there's a ton of, there's a big body of research on this and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, a ton of great work on it. But I think when it comes to, leadership giving in particular, sort of what you said is exactly right, where it's so nuanced in particular, right? Some people might feel more like the annual fund uh, because of their engagement in the org, just the amount is higher. Um, and that may be because of their own capacity. And some people feel more like major donors, right? Or are very engaged and, and want to show up. And so you do have this advantage of like, yeah, sort of identity and like collectivism and sort of being on the same team uh, yeah. with this. And you reference the sort of the, um, university legacy programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, you don't have that as much on the major side and on the annual side, you don't have as much engagement, right? So you have a, a place to really, I think, in, engage and cultivate donors where you can ask them to do more than just give, but to mm -hmm. bring other people together or to get the word out or something. And mm -hmm. people tend to listen to those folks because they are, they are quite engaged. Yeah, because they're leaders, if you will. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I'm fascinated by this because I, I think that real successful, and this is just in my purview, uh real successful fundraisers and i'm gonna push that up a little bit to successful leaders ceos board chairs they tend to work with donors in a way that develops the engagement right, right. that it's so you know every time you go on a tour you can get onto a campus or you can see the mission in action right it builds a relationship right, right. for the most part somebody's going to be like, wow, that's amazing versus like, oh, I saw that and I never want to give to it. Right. I mean, right. It, it doesn't happen. Right. For the most part, we 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 increase our level of desire to commit or to be engaged or to champion that that which we see. So how do you see this as that part of the psychology when we are now dealing with donors around the world or not in our community? like? How do we tap into that psychological connection, emotional connection? It's a it's a tough question when we say around the world or not in our community. Um, yeah. One of our, um, I have a friend who, who's a, a major gift fundraiser and um, she's been doing this a long time. And one of her sort of heuristics, right? Or, or her, um, one of the things she says the most is like, she wants to, when she goes and, and spends an hour with somebody, say a major mid-level donor, um, she wants them to enjoy it so much that they would invite her on a vacation for a week. Um, <laughs> and so there, there is this, um, it's about trust, right? Or relationships or friendship, like, you know, building this sort oh of thing. Oh my God, and that's hilarious. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting approach, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I love it. It gets it what drives um, 
giving in general, right? Is that like yeah. people give to people, they give to relationships, mm -hmm. they like, you know, you need to touch on meaning in their life. You have to mm -hmm. you know, do something that's more transactional, that's more than transactional, right? Basically. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, I think you have um, an opportunity to do that with leadership giving. On the remote side, I guess I would just say like more time on calls and stuff, like nothing, the reason why handwritten letters make a difference, right? Or when we're going in person does is because it shows the donor, like you only have so much time in a day and you're choosing to spend it with me. When you send right. out an email that's personal, when you send out that email to a hundred thousand people, they know that could have been a system, right? And so that wow. time is like our only limited resource. And so that fact that if you get onto a call with somebody who's um, say in London and they're, you know, an alumni of your, of your school um, and they're thinking about giving 50,000, that, that, that makes a huge difference, right? And of course, traveling, you know, this kind of thing, like I, I guess it's sort of a broken record, but like nothing beats just really meeting people in person, spending time with them, building trust, like real relationships. And you can do that on video. And then as you, as it gets more asynchronous, right, it's much harder to do. And so, right. um, yeah, I'm not a fan of um, more, more gathering together, even if it's remotely. Well, I got to tell you, I will never, ever forget the example of wanting to go on vacation. <laughs> that to me is like that. I don't know why. Maybe because as we we have this discussion, it's summer and people are in vacation mode. Right. But I absolutely love that because right. it speaks volumes about the relationship and the interaction and the exchange of ideas. And uh, right. yeah, it, we you start to ask it, donors, you know, how often have you been invited on vacation by your or fundraisers by your donors? Right. Um, right right no it's a great line it really is and it it paints a different picture for me so i really uh, appreciate you sharing that i think that's great sure. well nick fitz this has been a lot of fun founder and ceo of momentum check out givemomentum.com you can learn more about momentum and what they do and how they integrate this their systems into hopefully the systems that you're using uh, with your nonprofit to achieve your mission, vision, and values. Um, it's been a lot of fun, Nick, to get to know you and learn more about you. Um, and maybe we have to go on vacation. I'm just going <laughs> to leave it at that. <laughs> maybe we do. That's right. We'll talk about where we're going to go. Come down and visit you. Someplace not hot. I'm just saying okay, at, this point, at this point in time. Hey, another thing we want to do is to make sure we express our gratitude for our amazing, amazing uh sponsors and they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader your part-time controller fundraisers friday and 180 management group these are the folks that join us day in and day out uh, so we can have these amazing guests like we've had with nick fitz on today um, and talking about things that are really impacting our sector moving quickly making differences um, that are transforming the way that we work and the way that we support the nonprofit sector. So it's been a great conversation, Nick. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot. It was great hey, to be here. every day we end the nonprofit show with this line in this, I would call it a mantra, I guess at this point, and it goes like this, to stay well, so you can do well. We'll see you back here, everybody. Thanks.